Mr. McCown, back on the show. Welcome back. Thanks very much, Boomer. Good to be here. So, Patrick, you know, you and I have exchanged emails over the months over a m- multitude of different things, uh, anything from Scott Carney and the Wedge to uh, catnography to my recent obsession with freediving. And so I'm really glad to just... Uh, first off that you're just so generous with your time that you're coming back on the show today because you know your episode has generated a lot of interest and a lot of questions and I would love to delve a little bit further with with those today. Sure, sure, of course. All right, so as I may have alluded to before, Mm -hmm. um, I have this sort of recent obsession with the idea of free diving and, you know, trips to Mallorca can do that for people, right? Like beautiful sun, go underwater and, you know, the free diving instructors are obsessed with this idea of CO2 tolerance. And I, I just would love to understand a little bit more from you, you know, CO2 tolerance, is it the right focus for a free diver? And, you know, if it is, you know, why is it important? And if it's not, you know, what, what should we be focused on? I think it's one of them. I think it's one of the factors, there's no doubt. Um, carbon dioxide is one of those gases that's, you know, if we look at traditionally, and we looked at the Buteco method, Dr. Buteco, he said that breath hold time is correlating with with resting carb- with arterial CO2 levels. And studies then show that that's not necessarily true. However, breath hold time is lower in people with dysfunctional breathing patterns. That's correct. Breath hold time as it improves um, during rest, and I'm talking more about the bolt score, that once it's above 25 seconds, a fairly recent study showed that in 51 individuals that when the breath hold time is above 25 seconds, there's an 89% chance that dysfunctional breathing is not present. Now, how does that relate then to free diving? I think number one is, I don't think it's just CO2 tolerance that's influencing the person's ability to, to hold their breath. And there was an article written by Parks back in 2012, and he looked at the same issue. So he said it's actually what is causing the termination of the breath hold, because that's ultimately what free divers are about. They want to, how long can, can they stay underwater? How long can they hold their breath for before they are forced by the body to resume breathing? That's not carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide will be one of the factors. It seems to be that as carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood, of course, the brain is going to react to that. So the respiratory center reacts by sending increases impulses to the dive from breathing muscle to resume breathing. And it seems to be the involuntary contractions of the dive from breathing muscles, which in turn is feeding that information back to the brain. And that's what's terminating the breath hold time. So when we're looking at extending breath hold time, One of those factors is reducing chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. But another factor is, is improving lungs. Because if, for example, you have any individual with bronchoconstriction or airway narrowing or asthma or any respiratory complaints, it will negatively impact their breath toll time. Now that's going to be independent of CO2. And to give you an example, if you have somebody with asthma and if they have chest tightness or if they're wheezing, <clears throat> and if you give them a puff of a Ventolin inhaler, within about a minute or two, their breath toll time will increase. The carbon dioxide sensitivity hasn't reduced in that minute or two. So there's also feedback from the lungs back to the brain. There's feedback from the diaphragm back to the brain. There's feedback from the brain back to the, the breathing muscles. And there's a cognitive component as well. So the training is correct. Because how do you improve your breath toll time other than practice techniques, you know, exposing your body to air hunger? But the mechanism behind it, what's happening there, I'm not sure if anybody knows. Um, There's possibly a number of dimensions happening and not just about reducing the sensitivity to carbon dioxide. So, you know, carbon dioxide, again, you can have individuals, they're prone to breathing pattern disorders and their CO2 levels can be normal. And, you know, it's also was shown back in 1990 that you can produce the symptoms of hyperventilation. 
without having to lower CO2. So there's a behavioral mechanism as well with breathing. Like there's, it's more complex than we, of course, it's more complex than anybody thinks it's about. And the other thing I'd say about freedivers, you know, it's all very well practicing breath holding underwater, but how are you breathing outside of the water? How are Mm. you breathing when you sleep? How are you breathing when you do physical exercise? And that would be an interesting thing to do. You know, if you were to get two groups of free divers, one you train in traditional free diving techniques and the other you train by looking at their everyday breathing patterns and improving their everyday breathing patterns because <clears throat> you would have to assume this, that if, you're, if you have a free diver and they're training in their, every, in their normal free diving techniques, but then if they sleep with their mouth open at night, if they spend time breathing hard and breathing fast. In other words, if they have dysfunctional breathing patterns and also if they are prone to anxiety and panic disorder, um, you know, how is that going to impact their ability to free dive? And I think, you know, that should be considered that we cannot necessarily look at breathing in one dimension in time, but we have to look at the 24 hour picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are just multiple levels that I can take that one, Patrick. So I just want to mm-hmm. uh, want to break a few things down for people. So it, let's say if we were to pursue that second avenue of training, whereby not training as a traditional free diver, but training out of the water and just looking at day-to-day breathing techniques. Yes. If we're looking at that benchmark, uh, um, the right benchmark, I guess, should be, is it the bolt score? And if, if well, the, it is, the bolt, <clears throat> the bolt score is only going to, is going to be one of them. Uh, I think the maximum breathlessness test is probably going to be more, more applicable because you're holding breath, you're holding the breath until the extreme, mm-hmm. but both are correlated, you know, even though the correlation can be a little bit off with some people, we have to think of this, the bolt score is more objective because it's not influenced by willpower and determination. Mm-hmm. It's, a phys- it's a length of time that you can hold your breath for and there's a f- until there's a physiological reaction to resume breathing. And that reaction is that you either feel the first definite desire to breathe or you have the first involuntary contraction of the breathing muscles. Mm-hmm. Whereas the maximum breathlessness test, that's you take a normal breath in and out through your nose, you pinch your nose, you start walking and you count the number of paces that you can hold your breath to a maximum. And that's influenced by willpower and determination. So we could have a guy, we could have an athlete coming in with a bolt score of 20 seconds and a maximum breathlessness test of 80 to 100. And literally because of sheer willpower and determination, that athlete has held their breath to the point that, you know, they go blue. Mm -hmm. They can have a high MBT and they don't necessarily have a high bolt score. But typically, if it was to be done, Um, that there was a a reasonable application of willpower and determination, you'd find that there's some correlation there. Okay, so the bolt score, and I'll link to our first episode in the show notes, because I know we we did a little bit on that. But just to recap for people, it's best Mm. to, it's best to take it at approximately the same time every day. Does it matter morning, noon, night? Yeah, the morning, morning time is always best, you know, as soon as you wake up, you sit up in the bed, allow your breathing to recover and um, take your bolt score. And that's the more important measurement because your breathing isn't being changed, you know, in terms of you're not influencing your breathing during your sleep. Mm -hmm. So your breathing early morning is kind of a more reflection. It's a more accurate reflection of your everyday breathing patterns. Mm -hmm. And so when we have, we have the bolt score and the maximum breathless test, um, but on a, it sounds like there's a few muscles that we can train here as well, right? Yes. Like you have, you have lung, well, I guess maybe not the lungs as a muscle, but you can certainly train lungs and you can certainly train diaphragm. Yes. How do you look at training those particular, you know, areas? What's, well, I, th- I think, that? you know, well, number one, you can train the breathing muscles a number of ways. Nasal breathing is going to be absolutely key because your nose in comparison to mouth breathing, nose breathing imposes a resistance to your breathing two to three times that of the mouth. Mm -hmm. So if you went for a jog or a run with your mouth closed, that's likely to help maintain diaphragm strength because you're breathing against resistance. You know, if you're taking the air in through your nose and you have an extra load on the diaphragm, 
that's going to help to thicken the diaphragm, to strengthen the diaphragm. Another aspect, then, we use sports mask, which is mm -hmm. similar to the traditional training masks. I have um, one right here. You have one. And we use that, again, to breathe against resistance. So we set the valve. Now, we do encourage nasal breathing while wearing it. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't make sense, kind of, you know, I know there's a lot of respiratory muscle training devices and they're using the mouth to breathe, but mouth breathing is invariably activating the upper chest regions. Now, I'm not saying that respiratory devices using the mouth to breathe are not going to be effective. But what I would say is that it just seems logical that when you breathe through your nose, that you are, you have a greater amplitude of diaphragm nasal breathing. Mm -hmm. um, in the limited studies, because of course, this is very understudied. Yeah. You know, but it makes sense then to breathe through your nose while wearing those devices mm -hmm. to add the extra load onto the breathing muscles. Another aspect is we use breathing belt. So we use Buteco belt mm -hmm. and we have the individuals wear a belt around their midriff. We have them wear it during sleep. We have them wear it during physical exercise. And again, it's adding an extra load onto the breathing muscles because you're pushing against resistance. And then breath holding itself is going to help improve diaphragmatic strength because as you hold your breath, you have involuntary contractions of the breathing muscles. Mm -hmm. Now, so there's a number of ways to improve diaphragmatic strength, but also we have to consider functional breathing patterns. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about improving diaphragmatic strength, but it's also about breathing according, like if you look at breathing, if you, if you look at any paper written by researchers, and if researchers are screening breathing pattern disorders, they will look at breathing from three dimensions. First of all, they'll look at breathing from a biochemical point of view. That's all centered on capnography, that's measuring end tidal CO2. So basically they measure the carbon dioxide on the exhaled breath on the end of the breath, and that gives you a good indicator of CO2 in the blood. So capnography is looking at the biochemistry dimension of breathing. And then you look at the biomechanical dimension of breathing. And this is centered on whether the person is breathing high or breathing low. So we want low breathing with lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs because that's a very good gauge of the generation of what's called intra-abdominal pressure. And intra-abdominal pressure then is influenced by what's called the zone of apposition. Mm -hmm. And the zone of apposition is the distance from the top of the diaphragm after an exhalation, when the diaphragm has moved back up to its resting position, what's the distance from the top of the diaphragm down to the lower ribs? Mm -hmm. And if you can increase the zone of apposition, you can then increase intra-abdominal pressure. So that's the biomechanical aspect is looking at what's called the high-low test. And then there's another dimension that researchers look at is the psychophysiological dimension. And they use a questionnaire called the Nijmegen questionnaire from your country. Sorry, what's the, re repeat that one. It's the Nijmegen questionnaire? Nijmegen. So oh, okay, Nijmegen. like the university. Exactly. So I'm oh. assuming it came from the university. Mm -hmm. Now I have to say it's a, it's a pretty useless questionnaire, but it's validated. So you know, <laughs> the fact that it's validated. And the only reason I say that is because there's symptoms on it that shouldn't be on it. Mm -hmm. And then we see very common symptoms in chronic hyperventilation that aren't on it. Mm -hmm. So you'll find the Nijmegen questionnaire online and uh, you, you, you score it. It's a questionnaire and it's asking you some of the symptoms and some of the symptoms tingling around the mouth. We don't see that. You know, if somebody comes in to me, I've never seen that in 20 years. I've never mm -hmm. seen anybody saying to me, tingling around the mouth, confusion, losing contact with reality. I've never seen that with chronic hyperventilation. Um, there's other symptoms I can't, oh, I can't remember them but you see there's two I've mentioned there there's about four or five of them that have no relevance whatsoever and then there's symptoms that should be on it that aren't on it so we then look at breathing if I'm working with breathing you know I'm working with students I'm working to improve their functional breathing also from three dimensions slightly different to what the researchers are looking at of course we do breathe light which is biochemistry. That's all mm -hmm. about air hunger. Breathe low, which is the biomechanics. And then we bring in resonant frequency breathing as well. And that's to slow down the respiratory rate to, four, to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute. Mm -hmm. and that's to influence the autonomic nervous system, to stimulate the vagus nerve, 
to increase the sensitivity of the baroreceptors. And, um, you know, it's, it's really about improving resilience. So we bring all three together. So breathing is just more complex, you know, and I suppose a lot of breathing instructors will focus primarily on one dimension. Mm -hmm. So if they've historically only spoke about one dimension, that's what they focus on. You know, your yoga instructor, traditionally they will focus on the biomechanics. They don't mm -hmm. focus on the biochemistry and mm -hmm. they don't focus on resonant frequency breathing. Mm -hmm. You take off for years. My focus was primarily on the biochemistry and I didn't focus on the biomechanics and I didn't focus on resonant frequency breathing. Mm -hmm. Then you've got a heart rate variability instructor, you know, a heart map practitioner, for example, they will focus on resonant frequency breathing, but they don't focus on the biomechanics or the biochemistry. Now, I'm not saying these to complicated because people are saying, oh my God, now he's after making a whole, you know, like turning a, a two week course into a PhD kind of thing, which oftentimes can happen, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But it still has to just, that's the way it is. Breathing is a little bit more complex that, and the whole focus on carbon dioxide, while it certainly is part of the picture, there's no question about it. It's definitely part of the picture, but it's not the full picture. Okay, so I want to unpack a, a little bit of those those three pillars that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, and maybe if we can just go through them. So breathe light, yes, in terms of its impact on on the biochemistry. Are we talking about cadence here, or how are you how are you looking at this? Because breathe light can be interpreted many different ways, and I know yeah. we'll link to your book, of course. Yeah, like breathe light is all about reducing the volume of air that you breathe in to mm -hmm. allow carbon dioxide to accumulate in the blood. Because if you breathe slightly less air than what you're used to, carbon dioxide is going to accumulate in the blood because it cannot leave the blood so quickly through the lungs. Mm -hmm. And as carbon dioxide accumulates in the blood, you will feel air hunger. You will feel a need to breathe more air. But it has been shown that if you expose the body to increase carbon dioxide for short periods of time throughout the day for uh, say we'd say four to six weeks mm -hmm. that in turn is it does reduce the sensitivity to carbon dioxide what i'm talking about is i'm talking about exposing the body to carbon dioxide three millimeters of mercury pressure or three thor so the body is very very sensitive to an increase of co2 Mm -hmm. normal carbon dioxide in the blood is typically about 40 millimeters of mercury and if we increase it by between two and three millimeters of mercury it can double ventilation mm -hmm. so it's you know exposing our body to higher co2 and this is during the breathe light exercise now it's totally different if we do a breath hold and we don't do hyperventilation before breath holding like say for example that would be the difference with the vim hof me yeah. method so hyperventilation during the Wim Hof method blows off a lot of carbon dioxide, removes it from the blood through the lungs. And even during the breath hold, carbon dioxide doesn't recover. So the Wim Hof method is hypocapnic, hypoxic. Yeah, you Whereas, definitely don't want to do that during free diving, right? No, it's, well, you could die. It's as yeah. simple as that, you know. So the risk of underwater blackout, and it's happened, unfortunately. It has, yeah. Um, it's happened even with swimmers. You know, they take a few big breaths, <clears throat> as they sit at the side of the pool, they deplete their carbon dioxide levels, they get into the water, they're staying underwater and without any warning, there's no warning whatsoever, and it's blackout. Yeah. And the reason being is because carbon dioxide is that alarm to breathe, mm -hmm. and that feeling that one needs to take a breath, the primary driver is, is carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. So if we get rid of too much carbon dioxide, of course, we don't feel the need to breathe, you stay underwater and then your oxygen levels go too low. So you, you faint as a result of hypoxia. Um, so yeah, the biochemistry aspect of it, you know, you can look at reducing the sensitivity to carbon dioxide in a number of ways. One is you're breathing during rest. You're gently slowing down and reducing the volume of air that you are taking into the body. And that can be done two ways. Number one is when we look at breathing, we have to consider that minute ventilation or the volume of air that we breathe, typically measured in one minute. That is got by multiplying the respiratory rate by the tidal volume. So 
Say, for example, you have an individual with 10, 10 breaths per minute. That's their respiratory rate. And their tidal volume is 500 ml. So that's giving you a minute ventilation of five liters. Mm -hmm. Now, if you wanted to reduce breathing further, what you could do is you could reduce the respiratory rate, say down to seven breaths per minute, but keep the tidal volume relatively constant at a half a liter. So now you're reducing minute ventilation from five liters down to 3.5 liters. Or you could keep the respiratory rate relatively constant and you could reduce the tidal volume. So you could have your 10 breaths per minute, but instead of breathing 500 mil, breathe three, 300 mil. And that gives you three liters. Or you could change both. But the, the whole thing is that you know you're doing it correctly if you have air hunger. Mm -hmm. So, and the air hunger should be tolerable. When we're doing the breathe light biochemical, we want to have a feeling of air hunger, but we don't want the air hunger to be too strong that the brain reacts by sending involuntary by sending in increased impulses to the diaphragm mm -hmm. so that we have involuntary contractions of the breathing muscles. Okay, so that's during rest. And then if you're doing breath holding, now it's a different story in terms of CO2 because you're going to increase the carbon dioxide in the blood much mm -hmm. higher than what you would do with reduced volume breathing. But the dose, the dose is high, but the duration is shorter. Like if we have somebody do breathe light biochemistry, we can have them reduce their breathing for between four and 10 minutes. They feel air hunger for between four to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But if you were doing a breath hold, you're not going to expose your body to air hunger for that length of time because you can't, you know. Um, so in terms of then, the, the, we, we always look at what's the dose and what's the duration. Mm -hmm. reduce breathing while you're sitting down slowing down your respiratory rate the duration of the air hunger is longer but the dose is quite low breath holding the dose is high but the duration is short mm -hmm. and a different story then go for a run with your mouth closed mm -hmm. and that also is increasing co2 in the blood how do you know well quite simply you feel increased air hunger mm -hmm. you know if you have your mouth closed during physical exercise there's no doubt that it helps to reduce the sensitivity to carbon dioxide. Or at least there is a training effect that the individual can tolerate a higher CO2. Um, and, you know, it can take a number of weeks, but typically we would say about six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And so there's three different, we need to look at three different fields. We need to look at breathing during rest, breath holding itself, and also physical movement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there, if I just look at sort of the protocol for somebody, you said six to eight weeks, four to 10 minutes a day. After that, are they done? Or is it something that you want to prolong over a period of time? Like, do, should, should I be doing this the rest of my life? I, it really depends on the person's lifestyle. You know, mm -hmm. it's how many people are working in the offices? Well, not now, but they're working at home. And mm -hmm. They could be talking all day and mm -hmm. um, they're not getting out to do physical exercise. They're in overheated environments. It's very, very unnatural how we live. We don't yeah. live anything like our ancestors were living out in the, in, out in the out, outdoors, doing lots of physical movement, mm -hmm. eating natural foods. So we do have we have to realize that yeah how we live is certainly impacting our breathing and it's impacting our breathing negatively stress is probably especially chronic stress is probably the biggest it exerts the biggest impact to breathing patterns mm -hmm. because our breathing gets faster and harder mm -hmm. and of course prolonged stress it's causing a reduced it's causing an increased sensitivity to carbon dioxide and it's reducing the buffering so so the theory goes that if you expose the individual to prolonged stress, their breathing is going to get harder and faster. Their minute ventilation increases. They're blowing off too much carbon dioxide. Blood pH increases. The body doesn't want to be in a state of respiratory alkalosis. And as a result, then the kidneys, the body in order to maintain or bring normalized blood pH, the kidneys dump bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. Now you're left with a reduced buffering capacity. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like it's coming back to your question. 
I think the best way to do this is number one is we have to realize nobody is going to do this indefinitely. Yeah. Not possible. Yeah. Um, I did the breathing exercise with myself for years, formally um, putting it into practice. And now I would try to bring it into my everyday life, get out, do physical exercise, make sure the mouth is closed, mouth is taped at night. Mm -hmm. slowing down my breathing bringing my attention onto my breathing at different times throughout the day doing breath holding during the physical exercise itself and doing our best to bring it into one's way of life and mm -hmm. um, i think there's a there's we have to realize that you know how is the person breathing normally if they go around with their mouth open mm -hmm. are they breathing upper chest breathing are they sighing regularly do they have their mouth open during sleep do they have their mouth open during physical exercise? Well, just a simple realization that that's not the ideal way to do it. There is no comparison mouth breathing versus nasal breathing. Absolutely mm -hmm. no comparison. And it's really bizarre that sports medicine hasn't looked into this. It is so, so bizarre. I cannot, mm -hmm. I cannot understand how these intelligent individuals in universities from an academic point of view, that they haven't investigated nasal breathing. There's only one professor who was investigating it that I'm aware of, and his name is Professor George Dallam from, I'm not sure, he's from, I think it's Colorado, but if you put in D-A-L-L-A-M into mm -hmm. Google, you'll come across him. And he's published some papers on it. Mm -hmm. And here's the difference, you know, so you can imagine all of the sports scientists and all of these guys who really are supposed to know their stuff. And yet they never step back and they ask about the fundamental question, how should we breathe during physical exercise? Mm -hmm. Is it through the mouth? Is it through the nose? What are the disadvantages and advantages of both? But more importantly, the real question is, what happens if we get athletes to breathe through their nose for a period of time? Mm -hmm. what adaptations take place and those adaptations is what george dallam looked at now we've been talking about this for 20 years but of course we don't have the science because we, we are not affiliated with the university but we have seen the benefits firsthand and yeah sometimes people might say they're anecdotal it's not really anecdotal when you see it happening with hundreds and thousands of people Mm -hmm. You know, it's anecdotal if you see it happening in a couple of handful here and a handful there, and you're not quite sure is, it, is there an effect there. But when you see it being reproduced continuously and over a long period of time, you know, then we have to wonder, there has to be something in it, but mm -hmm. the science hasn't caught up. But in terms of like when an individual first goes for a run with their mouth closed, they're going to feel an increased air hunger. Mm -hmm. simply because it's more difficult to take in that larger airflow through yeah. the nose than through the mouth. And because of that, then they've increased air hunger, which is due to the carbon dioxide increasing in the blood. So now they are training with higher carbon dioxide. And as carbon dioxide is increasing, it's going to enhance the bore effect in terms of increased oxygen delivery from the hemoglobin to the tissues. Mm -hmm. so now you have you're able to stay you know with practice aerobically for longer the fraction of expired oxygen is less in other words the athlete who is training with their mouth closed they're utilizing oxygen better nasal breathing also enhances gas exchange from the lungs to the blood mm -hmm. and this has been known since 1988 that the po2 in the blood increases by 10 percent with nasal breathing Mm -hmm. But nasal breathing also is activating the diaphragm. You've got greater amplitude of the diaphragm breathing muscle. And the diaphragm breathing muscle is not just for respiration, but it's also to provide um, stabilization of the spine. And also, as we spoke about earlier, we just went on to a little bit, intra-abdominal pressure. So basically, functional movement and functional breathing go together. Mm -hmm. And if we are going around with our mouth to open and we are breathing fast, which is very uneconomical because we waste so much more air in what's yeah. called dead space, you know, as opposed to breathing slow and low. So think about the individuals then who get recurrent chest infections, head colds, exercise induced bronchoconstriction, dry mouths, dehydrated, um, dysfunctional movement patterns, increased risk of injury. Nasal breathing can influence all of that. 
and also the recovery from the from the the evidence of people um, reporting back to us because we've with oxygen advantage we've got about 200 instructors on the ground so you know they are in contact with a lot of clients mm -hmm. and this feedback comes into us recovery is better so there's something going on here and i think we would love to see the the, the sports the intelligent people in the universities the academics looking into it and there's no point in just getting a group of athletes and say oh today guys we're going to split you up into two groups I'm going to have group A, you're going to do all of your physical exercise with the mouth closed. And group B, you're going to just do it with normal breathing. Mm -hmm. Because that's going to be a total joke because group A has never performed with nasal breathing in their life. Yeah. And if you suddenly get a group of individuals on the first day and you test how does it, what happens when you switch to people from mouth to nose breathing, their, their results are going to be dreadful. And the reason being is because the increased resistance to breathing will be taxing on them. Mm -hmm. but So increased over time, but if you did it over that's time. It. We need to measure and test this when adaptations have taken place. Mm -hmm. And I know when, when Dallin was looking at it, like he looked at recreational athletes, their, their ventilation at six month follow-up was 22% less mm -hmm. with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. Like there's an economical saving there. If you can do the same work rate intensity with 22% less ventilation. Mm -hmm. You have to think of the savings in terms of VO2, you know, because there's an energy expended on breathing. And if our breathing is inefficient, we're going to be wasting energy unnecessarily. So I would say is a really, this is really crying out for a few studies mm -hmm. and get your groups of individuals, uh, randomize them, um, put them into different groups. You have the experimental group, you've got the, the normal, the control group, and ex put them into a training for about eight to 10 weeks, mm -hmm. so two months, and measure them after two months. Because I would say that it's eight, six to eight weeks is when the adaptations will take place. You don't need six months, mm -hmm. but give it two months. Call to arms there from Patrick uh, about yeah, scientific need, studies. Of course. So uh, one of the other things that you mentioned earlier is something called resonant breathing frequency. And yes. I, I'm, and so I, I love the concept. I know in practice, it's, it's very hard for the average Joe to identify what their resonant breathing frequency is. Do you mind just explaining what it is, why it's important and how somebody can figure it out? Yeah, for, for many, many decades, um, a good therapist, when, when a client or a patient, or a good therapist or a doctor would be interested to find out what state is this individual in, in terms of their autonomic nervous system? Are they in a stress state or are they, you know, is there a balance there? And what they would look at is they would measure, they would time the client's pulse, the patient's pulse. So they would locate the pulse and they would then observe the patient as they were breathing. And the doctor is looking out for, as the person is breathing in, the heart rate should be getting slightly faster. Mm -hmm. And as the person is breathing out, the heart rate should be slowing down. Now that's called, that's called um, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. And when that happens, it gives you a very good indicator that the person is, there's a nice balance there of the autonomic nervous system and a balance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic response. Now, that's what we want, because as human beings, we need to be able to adapt to different environments. Now, conversely, if a patient comes in and if the patient is unwell, either mentally or physically, the doctor is, is monitoring their, their timing of their heartbeat in synchronization with their breathing. And if the doctor notices that the timing, there's not much of a difference between the timing of the heartbeat and the way and the breath in, versus the timing of the heartbeat on the breath out, well, then the doctor knows this, is per this person is very much in a stressed state. Mm -hmm. So it's very important then to help bring that person into a better balance. And you can do this by slowing down breathing to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute. Now, much of this research started back in 1990 with a researcher called Paul Lehrer, L-E-H-R-E-R. -E -E and basically 
the optimal and probably a good average is about six breaths per minute. And mm -hmm. when you slow down your breathing to six breaths per minute, you stimulate the vagus nerve. And by stimulating the vagus nerve, it increases or secretes a substance called um, acetylcholine. And that in turn then seems to be what's modifying what's called baroreflex. And baroreflex is that it's a very good indicator of the functioning of the human body in terms of we have pressure receptors inside the major blood vessels. And when our blood pressure increases, the baroreceptors will notice this increase of blood pressure and will immediately send signals for the blood vessels to dilate and for the heart rate to slow down. So the baroreceptors are communicating with the brain and the brain is communicating with the blood vessels and the blood vessels dilate, the heart rate slows down and blood pressure normalizes. And conversely, if our blood pressure goes too low, the baroreceptors send immediate messages for the blood vessels to constrict and the heart rate to increase to normalize blood pressure. The sensitivity of our baroreceptors and the traffic from the vagus nerve both of those seem to be feeding into heart rate variability. And I'm not sure if it's been fully understood exactly what's the precise mechanism. Mm -hmm. Now, increased heart rate variability, like if you look at elite athletes, they're monitoring it. If you look at military, they're monitoring their heart rate variability. And an athlete, if they have reduced coherence, that the variability between their heartbeat has been has reduced. They typically don't train hard that day because they haven't recovered from previous trainings. Mm -hmm. So they will train hard when they know that they've recovered. But if they haven't recovered, they don't train hard because there's an increased risk of something going wrong or an increased risk of injury. So I think it's, you know, I suppose, like all of us, you know, we're, we're all going to be exposed to stress, workload, etc., and if you went to your local doctor and you say to your doctor, doctor, I'm feeling stressed, but well, that doctor is just looking at you and there's no way of clinically measuring the impact that the stress has in the body. Mm -hmm. But with heart rate variability, you can, you can measure that impact. Mm -hmm. So, and it has been shown like the research on breathing has really centered and focused around the HRV. Mm -hmm. Now HRV is only a measurement. The real question is, well, how can we improve heart rate variability? So how can we achieve a better balance of the autonomic nervous system that we are more resilient? To do that, there's a number of ways of doing it. Number one is breathe through your nose during sleep. That's mm -hmm. been shown. And again, anecdotally, no studies, but hundreds I, of- I, I've done that myself, right? Like mouth taping has, Correct. I can notice that bomb significantly. You, you see it. Um, another one is reduced volume breathing. So all of the breathing exercises that we do are increasing heart rate variability. However, during the exercise, HRV drops. Mm -hmm. But after the exercise, then HRV increases. Mm -hmm. There's been limited papers on that since 2017, looking at hypercapnia, high CO2, and the impact that that's having on HRV. Number three, um, increased diaphragmatic movement. So, for example, by slowing down the respiratory rate and engaging the diaphragm and increasing tidal volume, that in turn can increase heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. And number four, then, is slowing down the respiratory rate to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and the other thing, Boomer, sorry to cut across you there. Oh. I would say, like, how would we expect if an individual is going around with their mouth open, they have chronic nasal obstruction, they have their mouth open during sleep, they're sighing, their upper chest breathing, I would expect them to have reduced HRV. And if we look at individuals with anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, panic disorder, um, they typically have low heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. Going back to the, the resonant uh, frequency, is there a specific device where you can actually identify like, hey, if I'm breathing to X point X breaths per minute, that's my resonant frequency? Or is it best for the average person to just ballpark it between four and a half and six beats per minute? There are devices, but I think they're quite complex when you want to find out what is the optimal frequency yeah. for you. I think you can't go wrong if you're centering it around six breaths per minute. Okay. Um, 
there is a device which I'm looking to get. It's the Leaf because I'm not technological anyway. I have inner balance. I'll uh, I, I'll come have you, to them afterwards if you want. <laughs> yeah, well, that would be great because I bought inner balance. I've used it about three or four times, and I'm just not into technology. Yeah. Um, but the Leaf one I'm intrigued with because from our instructors that are wearing it you're strapping it just below the heart. Mm -hmm. And um, when you get stressed, it's sending some signal that you're in that state of stress and it's telling you really to slow down your breathing to help activate the body's relaxation response. And I also like the reading of it in terms of it's going to give you a measurement of where you are, um, typically up to 100 or thereabouts. Whereas with the heart, with the heart mat one, it's quite difficult yeah. to, to see exactly where are you at with that. Mm -hmm um we'll have that conversation afterwards but those guys I, I, i'm friends with them so uh, mm -hmm. one thing i want to come to now that there's this sort of capno theme that we continue to hear throughout this conversation is capnography and yeah. looking at you know i i do love technology um and i like measurement and so yes. you have the ability to uh, look at a capnography machine versus, uh, let's say, a pulse oximeter. Are they comparable? Which one should we choose and, and why? Capnography, first of all, um, I think it's very difficult to get one that's accurate. Mm -hmm. And we haven't gone down that route. So and the reason being is because I don't want to put two, three thousand dollars into something. Yeah. And then realize that it's going to be absolutely no use to me. Or um, six or 12 or whatever more, it is. Right? Correct. Yeah. And the other thing we have to consider is that capnography, you're, you're taking, it's measuring end tidal CO2, end of breath, so end tidal. And that should give you a good approximation of the CO2 in, in the blood. But if you have an individual have a really prolonged exhalation, the CO2 from the blood is going to come into the lungs and maybe that can show as a higher breathing versus somebody with shallow breathing. So it's, you know, like, what are we measuring here? Are we measuring their end tidal CO2 during their normal everyday breathing? Is it accurate? Or are we measuring their CO2 levels during the practice of reduced volume breathing or slow breathing? Um, so, I suppose there's a couple of things to take into consideration, but yeah, I haven't just gone down that route and primarily because I don't know how accurate these, this equipment is. Mm -hmm. Can you accurately measure end tidal CO2? In terms of pulse oximetry, we use it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you can get devices which are fairly accurate. Traditionally, we were using NONIN, which stands for non-invasive. They're very good devices. They're made in the United States. The only issue I'd have with them is that they're very expensive. Mm -hmm. And when I was buying them, we were buying them typically in batches of 10 and 20 pieces and they were breaking on us. Mm -hmm. So then I looked at Contact Medical. There was a study done of cheaper pulse oximetry. And they looked at a particular one, uh, the CM, I'll show it to you here. And this, in the study, this one here has been shown to be accurate mm -hmm. when comparing it against the more expensive devices. Mm -hmm. And this one here is the CMS50DL. So I bought a thousand of them in from Contact Medical. <laughs> of course, they're all made in China anyway. Yeah. Um, but at least we had a study showing that when it was compared against the more accurate ones, that it was accurate. Mm -hmm. And... That's what we're using. So we're using contact medical at the moment. None would be my preference, um, but limitations in terms of typically you, you might be spending about 200 euro for a non -in. with contact medical. We sell them, for example, for about 26 euro, 27 wow. euro. So there's a huge difference. And I think it's sufficient um, in terms of a more robust pulse oximeter, which is cheap and can provide you an accuracy. Why not? What about, uh, you know, Garmin has these features, right? And their watches. Any concern about the accuracy of a wrist wearable on pulse oximetry? Don't know. Haven't looked at it. Um, the feedback on the Garmin's has been very good from any of our instructors who are using it. And I think it's tracking HRV as well, isn't it? The Garmin is. It, they have yeah. this sort of 
esoteric stress score, but it's it, it's effectively HRV, yeah. Okay, so I've heard good stuff about it, but I don't know again. And it's six hundred dollars to get one of those things. As well, I suppose if you want to get just a simple pulse oximeter, and um, because like they were they're very simple you know in terms mm -hmm. of there's a little a little infrared light inside it um basically that this one here isn't mm -hmm. isn't kicking in but basically what that is doing it's monitoring um your hemoglobin mm -hmm. which is carrying oxygen and it's it's looking at the fraction of your hemoglobin occupied by oxygen so yeah they're they're pretty pretty simple and good devices to use now we use them from two points of view Number one is you, we use them during breath holding to motivate athletes to show them that, yes, we do put you into an anaerobic state. Mm -hmm. You know, we are holding the breath. Your blood oxygen saturation is dropping. You can visually see that by virtue of the pulse oximetry and your carbon dioxide levels are increasing. And this is producing a combined effect, hypoxic hypercapnic training, which disturbs the blood acid base balance which in turn is, um, is improving the buffering capacity inside in the muscle compartment. Now, earlier on, I spoke about functional breathing and I spoke about nasal breathing, not getting a whole lot of research, but thankfully, breath holding on the exhalation, which we've been practicing for 20 years, is getting a good lot of research. And that's coming out of Paris. And there's researchers there, one is, um, Wurons, W-O-O-R-O-N-S, and putting out research every few months on it, and even looking at repeated sprint ability, for example, in rugby union players, mm -hmm. divides them into two groups. They were 21 years of age, <clears throat> professional athletes, had them do, in the first week, two sets of eight reps of 40 meter sprints in the breath hold, a departure every 30 seconds, and the second and third and fourth week, I think, increased it three sets a week mm -hmm. and then measured at the beginning of the trial, both groups were achieving about nine reps, nine repeated sprint ability, 40 meter sprints before exhaustion. And at the end of four weeks training with Brett Tolling, with the experimental group, they increased their repeated sprint ability from nine to 14.8. And the control group increased it from nine, something like 10.2. Now we have to bear in mind, these are elite professional athletes during peak season. And to get those gains, to increase from nine to 14.8 is tremendous, you know? So I think there's definitely something in it, looking at breathing, not just from the point of view of stressing the body, because mm -hmm. that's what we do when we do breath holding, but also bring in functional breathing and bring in breathing during sleep. Mm -hmm. So looking at training protocols for people, uh, if you were yeah. to start something like this, and of course the, the, the guide here is the book and the classes, but also if you were to start looking at this as sort of um, a day-to-day -day protocol, how do you recommend for, let's say somebody who's a busy person yeah. uh, to start working this into everyday life and then is six to eight weeks the right duration just to see? Yeah, like you'll feel difference in less than six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Like we can see people feeling a difference mm -hmm. two to three days, depending on the person. Mm -hmm. But the first thing that I would say is get your mouth closed at night. Mm -hmm. and there's a couple of options. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of options in terms of mouth closure. This mm -hmm. was one that we were using traditionally. That's the one I'm using right now, by the way. 3 m Microfor. Yeah. So you typically take off a strip of about six inches or so, 10 centimeters, mm -hmm. fold a tab either side of it, close the lips. Now we much, develop- Much to the dismay of my girlfriend, by the way. <laughs> but she'd be happy to uh, reduce snoring and reduce sleep apnea and things like that as well. And that's very important too. And there's a significant difference. now. The other one that we use is we have a tape called Myo tape, which mm -hmm. I brought out. I'm not sure if it was out the last time I was talking to you. I don't you. think so. Um, we launched this about three months ago. No, it's about more. It's about five months ago. And I, sp I developed it, first of all, for children and teenagers, because children who are sleeping with their mouth open, it's having a negative impact on craniofacial development. Mm -hmm. um, they're more likely to have crooked teeth, their jaw set back, and academic achievement. Um, is impacted because children who are mouth breathing are more likely to be sleepy 
And children who are sleepy have 10 times the risk of learning difficulties. Mm -hmm. And it's even worse than that. If we look at a study by Karen Bonnock in the Stratford-upon-Avon in the UK, over an eight-year period, she looked at 11,000 UK children and children with sleep disorder breathing, of which mouth breathing is a contributory factor. These kids, if untreated, if they, if they had sleep disorder breathing, which included snoring at age five, if untreated at age five, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. And I remember Dr. Christian Gimeno, I was at a conference in Bordeaux back in 2016. I was talking there and he was talking there, it was a sleep congress. And he stood up and he said, he says, we need engineers and we need all of these professions. But he said, children, their brains are getting fried. And that's what he said. And here is the founding father of sleep medicine. And he's talking about the, the brains of children getting fried. And he said, we must have our children get their lips together. We must restore nasal breathing. And I go on that the only valid and complete correction of pediatric sleep disorder breathing is restoration of nasal breathing, both during wakefulness and sleep. Okay, mm -hmm. totally overlooked, Boomer. Absolutely overlooked. I was giving out about lack of science earlier on. The lack of awareness in the medical profession of the importance of nasal breathing. It's almost that doctors, they don't realize that the nose performs some function in the human body. Now, people say, well, it couldn't be as simple as that. Look at it this way. Can you give me any function that the mouth does in terms of breathing? And the answer is no. And even if we just look at the anatomy of the mouth here, so say for instance, here's this, here's, you have the nose here, you have the chin, and here you have the mouth itself. Mm -hmm. When we take air in through the mouth here, that air is going straight down the throat. The mouth performs zero functions in terms of breathing. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about moistening or warming or filtration. The nose performs up to 30 functions in the human body. And yet between 25 and 50% of studied children persistently mouthbreed. And very few people is talking about this. And that's really a problem. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm going to answer your question. And I'm just going to show this tape here. So this is myotape. Mm -hmm. And we developed it primarily for myofunctional therapy or the dental profession. Now, I've only got the children's one to hand. So it's going to be a bit small, but it gives you the idea. You get the tape. It's kinesio tape. Mm -hmm. The glue has been altered. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the kid's variation. So you see it being stretched here. Yep. It's pulling the muscles in a bi-directional relationship, which is helping to ensure nasal breathing, but there's no risk. The child was to get sick, something like that. The child can have the mouth open. So if you were looking at a protocol, I would say... Absolutely nobody should wake up at a dry mouth in the morning. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two, practice slowing down your breathing, breathing in and out through your nose, but really reduce the volume of air that you breathe for about 10 to 15 minutes before sleep. Mm -hmm. That will help to improve sleep. Number three, do all of your physical exercise with your mouth closed. So if you walk for a half an hour a day, you go for a jog, you go for a run, do it with your mouth closed. But in the first couple of weeks, you might feel that the air hunger is a little bit, you know, stronger. It's going to be normal. Now, you, what you could do is, if you have a nose like mine with very small nostrils and deviated septum, and it's very common, mm -hmm. the air hunger can be too much. So what I would suggest then is that people get a nasal device, mm -hmm. a nasal dilator, and that simply goes up into each side of the nose Mm -hmm. and you just gently push it up there and it opens up the nose and it mm -hmm. allows easier nose, nasal airflow. So then I would say is during your run, if you're not pregnant, if you've got no med medical conditions, after you've warmed up in your physical exercise and you're going fairly lightly, take say a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinch your nose and hold your nose and hold your breath for maybe 10 or 15 paces. Mm -hmm. as you continue to run then let go breathe in through your nose continue running then jogging for about a half a minute to a minute and do it again do five reps of breath holds during your run mm -hmm. um like it's more complex i'm only 
giving a few simple things that people could bring in. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm glad you are because I think the book is a great place to refer people because you're getting in a lot into nitric oxide there, aren't you? There's more stuff than, yeah. There's you know, more of course, stuff. I'm trying to simplify it, but it's, yeah. there's obviously a lot more complexity behind it. And the other thing is then, you know, really make, make sure that you are breathing through your nose and, you know, you could have your hands either side of your lower ribs and as you breathe in that your ribs are gently moving out and as you breathe out, your ribs are gently moving in. Mm -hmm. Like, think of breathing. It should be light, it should be slow, it should be deep, LSD, um, an easy way to remember it. So light is about breathing a little bit less. Mm -hmm. Slow breathing is about slowing down the respiratory rate. And deep breathing simply means that you have lateral expansion and contraction of the lower ribs. I may have to title the episode light slow and deep uh, because yeah it's good well people but, from emerson what yeah, better town to talk about that than amsterdam yeah right? amsterdam or just you know the beatles have have rung that one a few times and you know we've, we've talked recently on the show about psychedelics so i think it'll resonate pretty well with people good stuff good stuff uh patrick this is fantastic and thank you for all of the i uh, really tactical information when it comes to breathing. And I, I always love your work because, and I mentioned this on the last episode and I do mean it, it's the audio book that I go back to again and again when it comes to breathing. And I know breath is very sexy right now and there are mm. a number of books out there, but your book is how many years old now? It's five years, yeah, yeah. 2015. And I've, I think I've gone through it at least a half a dozen times, which wow. just in the grand scheme of any book, I don't think it's I think it's uh probably up there in terms of repeat reads but in terms of health books that's probably number one in terms of repeats so thank you for everything that you do where can people find out more about you the work that you're doing uh, oxygen advantage be taken all of that stuff sure for for sports performance the best website would be oxygenadvantage.com mm -hmm. and instagram is oxygen advantage and then for people say with sleep disorder, breathing for panic disorder, anxiety for asthma, that's butecoclinic.com. And the thing it's Buteco Clinic is the Instagram feed. I don't tend to look after social media, whatever mm -hmm. girls does it. So I'm not totally okay with it. But and then the tape for the mouth is very simple, my o tape, my o tape .com. And uh, yeah, I have another book written and I've just finished it about a month ago. So we're doing final edits of it. It's 140,000 words. Um, it's moved away a little bit from the oxygen advantage to sports performance kind of in health to mm -hmm. primarily health. And mm -hmm. it's looking at different topics, diabetes, epilepsy. And it's looking at asthma again. Huge emphasis on children because I think it's really being overlooked. Even though Boomer, this has been discussed since 1909. You know, it's been written about Back in the dental journal back then, Dental Cosmos, about the impact of mouth breathing causing crooked teeth in children. And how many kids now have overcrowding of teeth yeah. and mouth breathing is contributing to that. But again, nobody talking about it. Or there are some, but very few. So I'm hoping that the books are helping to shed some light and to generate some awareness, generate some debate. And it's very simple, you know. The only problem is, I think the reason that this hasn't scaled is because you cannot bottle it. You cannot put it into a bottle and sell it. No and patent. That's there. no patent. And that's why it hasn't got the attention. So so that's why I'm always appreciative. Thanks very much for your podcast, for putting the information out there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great. Thanks. Well, Patrick, thanks again. And to everybody listening out there, I know Patrick referenced a few diagrams. We're going to link to those on YouTube. And of course, the show notes for this one are at decodingsuperhuman.com slash oxygen advantage too. Patrick, thank you so much. Thank you, Boomer.